um, to everyone after. And um, I'll also send it, be sending a recap. So ways, different resources, ways to stay connected with James and Ryan and Hirewell, as well as ways to stay connected with I'm La Vida too. So now officially done rambling, I will hand it over to James and Ryan. Thank you both so, so much for being here with us today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for inviting us on. Um, Ryan, do you want, uh, we can do intros. Do you want to kick off the uh, slide? Uh, otherwise I'm going to forget Absolutely. what I was supposed to say. <laughs> yep, let me, <laughs> I know, important. We need that. We need those talking points. Let me share my screen really quickly with everyone and then we can get moving. So, um, one thing I, I guess just start introducing ourselves. So, uh, Ryan and I are both from Hire Well. Um, I'm James Hornick. I'm one of the um, partners at Hire Well. I'm also a, a co-founder of Career Well. Um, to give you guys just a quick overview of, I guess, my experience um, as well as kind of what our what our companies do. So, I've been with Hire Well since 2005. Uh, we are a Chicago-based recruiting firm. Um, when I joined, we were tiny. We were four people, um, very, very focused in technology recruiting. Um, we've now grown to about 50, roughly, um, and we actually cover a wide uh, range of areas. So we have five specialized teams of recruiters. Um, we have a team in technology, obviously. Uh, the team that Ryan's on is focused in HR uh, recruiting. We have a digital marketing recruiting team. We have a sales recruiting team, and we have a finance and accounting recruiting team. So we work with uh, all different types of companies, a lot of startups, a lot of enterprise firms, a lot of consultancies and agencies around the Chicagoland area and outside the Chicagoland area too. Um, one thing that's, I guess of note, like this has been a crazy year. Um, as soon as the, you know, late March when the, the pandemic struck, like we knew as a recruiting firm, we're gonna have a little bit of extra time on our hands right now. You know, like no one was doing any hiring at all those first, or those first couple of weeks. Um, one thing we always wanted to do was start, it was create services that are actually more focused on job seekers. Cause, um, I don't know how much you know about the recruiting industry is that, you know, people like myself and Ryan, like we're in this because we love helping people. We want to help everyone as best we can, but ultimately as recruiters, our job, like our companies are who hires us. So, um, we're primarily responsible to help them fill the positions they need help with. And if we can help people along the way, that's great. Um, we wanted to, um, to take it a step further though. We had some time available. We launched another brand called career. Well, um, so careerwell.io, uh, if you want to check it out, that's actually focused on helping people become better job seekers. So it's very much a, a people first, a job seeker first mission. Um, and we went about a couple things with that. So there are, um, we created a lot of core content for this site. Uh, we did about 200 free coaching sessions. Um, and again, we're just focused on like how to help people find that, land that next job. But we're, we talked with lots of people to understand where they may have, um, where they're struggling. You know, I think most people have 80% of it and it's just a few small things here and there that need some little bit of help with. Um, so it's kind of understanding those things and then building a core curriculum around that. Uh, we also have some technology tools we've developed. One of them we're gonna show a little bit later in the presentation. Um, and then we can also do some one-to-one -one coaching people who really need kind of extra help. Um, so my role is you know, with Hire Well Now, I went from, I started as a tech recruiter, so I understand that space really well. I went to digital marketing recruiting, and now I, I run our marketing, our business development content initiatives, those types of things. Um, and I've been talking too much, so Ryan, would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> sure thing. So my name is Ryan Brown. I've been with Hirewell for three years. I just celebrated my three-year anniversary the other week. Um, and like James mentioned, I sit on our HR and administrative practice. So I focus on filling positions within the whole umbrella of human resources, primarily in Chicago, but also outside of uh, the Chicagoland area too. And then I partnered with James and a few other folks here at Hirewell to kind of build out CareerWell and create the content behind that. So that was a really fun initiative that we oversaw this past year. And then I also partnered with James on a lot of our marketing and branding initiatives. So if you go to the Higher Wall website and our LinkedIn page, you will see our face quite a bit. All right, let's get into it. Um, so what's cool about today's presentation is um, we're actually going to do a few things. So we're going to have some slides and some things here, but we're also going to uh, go show you guys um, a LinkedIn recruiter. So we're kind of going to bounce back and forth between two different things. Um, first wanted to, let me move my, uh, uh, my view here so it's not covering up my screen. All right. Um, what we're going to cover in this is really kind of three main things. So 
Um, there's marketing concepts. For those of you who are in marketing, you're going to understand search engine optimization and branding and how that applies to job seekers really well. Um, it may be in a different lens than you haven't thought of before. If you're not in marketing, some of these things might be new concepts. Um, we're also going to get into um, breaking down the LinkedIn profile. Um, there's a lot of areas there. Um, some of these areas are critically important if you want to be found by a recruiter. Honestly, some of them aren't. I think some of the things they threw in there over the years they just wanted to see if they were sticky, if they work or not. And I'm never suggesting anyone not fill things out on their LinkedIn profile. But um, I get a lot of questions, people really stressing out about certain areas that really aren't as important, whereas the stuff you want to spend your time on is the three or four areas that are important. Um, and then lastly, um, kind of giving you guys a, a peek behind the hood, uh, we want to show you the LinkedIn recruiter profile, which is very different from the standard LinkedIn. It's extremely granular. And I think understanding just how uh, how granular it can, recruiters can get in their searches will give you a better understanding of um, how you're being found or not being found. Um, and so just to, uh, I think that'll be helpful as well too. Uh, question that came in, is this webinar recorded for later viewing? Yes, it is. So we will be recording this for everyone. All right, so the first thing I wanna get into, um, recruiters use LinkedIn to Google you. So just kind of think of this as an example. Um, you know, when you're using, when you're Googling somebody, when you're a consumer, you're trying to find someone based upon keywords. Um, in this scenario, the recruiter is you and your profile is that product or service you're looking to find. So if you want to be found, you have to start thinking in terms of what recruiters might want to search on, what aspects of your profile, whether it's keywords or where you have things set up. Um, there's over 500 million LinkedIn users. Um, so even if you have a spot on background for some search a recruiter is going for, um, you, you know, even if they, if you're in Chicago and you think there, there still may be thousands of people with your exact same, at least by keywords with a very, very similar skill set. So it's how do you make sure that you're actually showing up in the first one, two or three pages to make sure they're actually finding you. Um, so some, some core concepts in terms of marketing. So search engine optimization, um, that's, you want to increase the quantity and quality of traffic to your profile. So it's all about keywords, you know, making sure all the different variations that recruiters could be using to find someone with your background, making sure that's in your profile, because if it's not, you're literally just not going to show up in their searches. Um, then there's branding, which is completely separate. So this is once a recruiter finds you, thinking about how you can make an impression that distinguishes yourself from other job seekers. You know, you want to leave an impact in their minds, recruiters, they remember you. So step one is how do you, how do you become found by recruiters? And step two, how do you actually make sure they remember you enough or you are notable enough? They actually want to want to contact you. All right, James, do you want to take this one or do you want me to jump in? Uh, I think this is where you kind of take over the, the remainder of the presentation. I think so, too. So everyone <laughs> gear up. I'll be talking for about the next 45 minutes to an hour and James will chime in accordingly. Um, so one of the things we want to talk about so you can understand the different search capabilities within regular LinkedIn, which is the version that everyone has access to, and LinkedIn Recruiter, which is a premium version that you pay for that allows you a lot of different areas to kind of narrow in on specific searches. So when we look at LinkedIn itself, it has search capabilities, um, and they're the following areas. You can search by connections or current or past companies, keywords, industry, location, even profile language. Um, so you can see there, it's a short list, but there's still capabilities. When we look over at the LinkedIn recruiter search fields, we've obviously added quite a bit of search capabilities on this side of things. And one thing that I want to note about each of the categories that we have um, on this list is there's actually subset categories of each of those two. So we can get really specific, really granular with LinkedIn recruiter. Um, so some of the areas that we can search on candidate details, company, education, and experience, employment type, job titles, keywords, location. We can even look at recruiting and candidate activities. So for example, if James is using LinkedIn recruiter and messaging folks, I can see that activity on my side too, so that we're not trying our best not to cross contact folks. Um, we can look at skills, year of graduation. And I think one of the most important features of LinkedIn recruiter is we actually have the ability to exclude certain fields or keywords too. So you can see the difference between the two here. LinkedIn recruiter is a much more um, robust search capability than regular LinkedIn. 
All right. So how are recruiters searching LinkedIn? Um, we want to talk about this in the sense of understanding why you need to optimize your LinkedIn profile and how that's showing up on the recruiter version of LinkedIn. So like James mentioned before, optimizing your LinkedIn profile really increases the likelihood that recruiters such as myself and James are going to find you in searches. So there's two primary methods that recruiters use when searching, and those are filters and keywords. So when we're thinking about the most common search fields that recruiters are using, they're the following title. So what's the name of your position? What's the title you, you hold at your company industry, the sector or type of corporation that you work for schools. There's even sometimes we're working on specific roles where we need to target somebody that comes from a specific college or university maybe because they have a great program and let's say human resources and our clients had a good um a good opportunity filling roles up from these folks in the past next is location where you live obviously an important uh, search function there and then keywords so these are going to be the words that are really pertinent or important to your industry or profession so we delineated between the differences in the previous slide the search capabilities between LinkedIn and LinkedIn Recruiter. So you can see that there's a ton of other search areas that we can get really granular and search with to specify, which is what makes LinkedIn Recruiter such a great tool for us. One thing I'll, I'll add in here and chime in with, and I'll, this is something I'll probably say two or three times throughout this presentation. Um, the key, like as the world has gotten more complex and people's um, skill sets and technologies and things they they use becomes more specific, it's given recruiters more of an opportunity. It's given hiring managers a reason to ask for more specific things, and therefore recruiters search on more specific keywords. Um, and that's why if there's a new technology stack or process or something that you're using and you're position. Um, those are things, and Ryan will give some examples of this a little bit later on. You always want to make sure you have listed in there, at least on your position, and maybe in a few other places, um, because if that is something that becomes a like a quote unquote disqualifier keyword that a recruiter uses, um, if it's not in there, again, you're not going to show up in the first few pages of someone's of someone's search, or if at all. Good point, James. All right, so now the nitty gritty of what you guys are all here for what's critical or important when you're optimizing your LinkedIn page. So we think there's three main areas that are going to be where you want to spend the most amount of time putting in information, optimizing your LinkedIn profile. And these are the really critical sections. So the first is your header. Um, and I'll show an example of where these sections lived on, uh, live on your LinkedIn page so that you can see a real time example. But um, the header is really a statement about what you do, who you are, and how you can add value. A lot of people use this as an opportunity to restate their job title. And that's not what this section is going to be. We want this to be attention seeking or attention grabbing. You can get really fun and creative with this. James is my best example when talking about this section. He has dubbed himself the number three most sarcastic recruiter on LinkedIn. He definitely holds the number one spot. And I think he's made some tweaks to that header as well, as he's gotten a little bit better at branding himself on LinkedIn. What's your what's your title or your, or your header right now, James? Uh, it's, know? It's, I still have uh, I still have number three most sarcastic uh, in there. I think I, I say that I I help companies hire well and I never use oh, puns. I like I was yeah. gonna say I like that pun. Uh, but it's <laughs> but the the thing is it, like um it it is I've had lots of people start conversations based upon my headline only. Mm -hmm. So and I know a lot of other people I've talked to who have headlines that are somewhat, I have a friend of mine who's um, a perennially disappointed Cowboys fan. Like he's actually had professional conversations that started based upon people finding his, his head are somewhat amusing. I, it's, I think it's important that you have something that's actually serious about what it is you do and then you just have fun with it. But it should be more specific in terms of like what your what your mission is or what you're really about, as opposed to just restating your title, because there's two other sections where you can do that. Exactly. So when James talked earlier about the SEO and branding components, this is where we want to kind of delineate what those look like. So the header is going to be important for both of those areas. It's a searchable function by recruiters, but also like we've mentioned, it's a great piece for branding too. And your header is something that's going to follow you around LinkedIn. So when you comment on something or like a post, it's going to show your name and the header. So again, it's a really important piece for branding because this is what helps you stick out um, when you're act when you're you know having activity on linkedin next is the summary section so we want you to think of this more as your digital cover letter this is really a place for you to add a lot of color and context to your background 
think of this section um, as your audience. So if you were your audience, a recruiter, or hiring manager coming to your profile, what do they need to know about you? What's going to be important? How can you separate yourself from the rest of the folks that are maybe in the mix for this? So you can get personal, tell your story about how you maybe found your way into a certain career, talk about maybe how you're wanting to change career paths and the reason behind that. It's a good place for you to give a lot of context there. And again, this piece is going to be important for both the SEO and branding um, component. So it's a searchable function as well. And then finally, experience. So this is an, an area where a lot of people tend to just copy and paste what's on their resume or maybe even just put bullet points of their day-to-day -day responsibilities. And it's more than that. This is a, an opportunity for you to really tell a story and give context to your accomplishments. When you think of this section, you want people to leave your profile knowing exactly what it is that you do, your key accomplishments, responsibilities, um, and that sort of thing. And this is going to be most important for the SEO um, side, where a lot of recruiters will use this to narrow in on their searches and see if you're really a good fit. Um, we do have a piece of um, information that we want to share that's um, that goes along with this, Pete. Um, we had mentioned career well at the beginning of this um, webinar. And so we want to um, share a tool that we've created on that site really quickly. So um, I'm going to go to the career well website. Hopefully everyone can see this. Um, and if you go to our tool section, we have a tool in here called a resume refinery. And see it here on the left hand side and essentially this tool is helping you to get instant feedback on your resume the format the content and that sort of thing we'll click into it really quickly as well just so you can get a better understanding but essentially we want you to use this piece to help you increase your chances of getting through the filter of applying for a job so you can see the two sections down here where you copy and paste your resume and then copy and paste the job description hit scan and it's going to give you a lot of relevant um, recommendations make specific um, make specific recommendations for you to better delineate yourself as a top candidate for a role yeah so this really um those of you we're actually we're white labeling job scan for this so if those of you who are familiar with job scan it's a great tool um, and you can use it here for free but ultimately what um if you um, obviously, we're talking about LinkedIn profiles, not resumes, but if you have your experience and how you have it in there currently, you paste it on the left side, and then you play around with maybe three or four different job descriptions of jobs you're interested in, it'll tell you exactly where your gaps are, what keywords you're missing, what things you need to kind of work on tailoring a bit. So it'll give you a lot of kind of guidance uh, using data science in terms of what you may be missing versus uh, just trying to figure it out on your own. So it's pretty helpful. Exactly. Can you go back and show us how to get there again? Sure. All right, so if you go to the CareerWell website, it's just careerwell.io. Picked a great time to slow down on you. I know, um, exactly. <laughs> if you go to CareerWell, it hit tools. And then it's just sitting there on the left-hand side. Resume so refiner. On. So spend some time on it, um, play around with it. It's kind of fun actually, um, but it'll give you some good recommendations. Um, exactly. And if it tells you one or two things you're totally missing and you realize it's well worth the time spent, so. Next, we're gonna talk about um, the nice to have section. So um, these are gonna be the components of your LinkedIn profile that you, know, you can absolutely fill out and we suggest that you optimize, but they're not gonna be as important as those critical pieces that we had discussed earlier. So the first one is the featured section. This is a newer section that came out LinkedIn, I think it was earlier this year. Um, and it's a really cool way for you to highlight yourself once people are on your profile. So we think you should lead with something that's visual. For example, James and I have a ton of things saved on our featured section where we do a lot of these webinars or videos that we post on LinkedIn. We keep a lot of that information there. We've also saved some of the articles that we've written and things like that. So it's just a great way for your network to get to know you. It's really, it can be important for your branding piece and things like that. It's just a cool section to have. And I, you know, we think it's great to add a little more, a little more color um, to your profile, but it's not necessarily going to be a function that recruiters are looking for when they're trying to find um, a good person for a role that they're working on. Yeah, I would I would kind of characterize it as this. If you're if you're active on LinkedIn and that's part of your part of your strategy where you post a lot, or if you've um, 
uh, spoken at a conference or there's something off of LinkedIn, there's a, a link that you think is relevant that'll be impressive. You want to put that there since it'll show up in kind of front and center in your profile. Uh, if not, no big deal. Um, the key thing is like no one, no recruiter is going to not contact you because they didn't see something in your featured section. So um, you're, you're not going to limit yourself in any way per se. It's just if you do have some things you want to highlight, it might make you might make you a little bit more memorable. Yeah, good point. Um, next, endorsement skills and interests. So these are more highlighted sections where you can add a bit more color to your background. Um, this can be somewhat important for the SEO. So there's some of these features that we can search on. Um, a lot of these, you know, if you look at somebody's LinkedIn profile, for example, if you go to mine, someone endorsed me for potatoes. No idea what that means. Perhaps I'm great at cooking them. I don't know, but it can kind of be a way that like friends or people in your network that maybe you have a good relationship with on LinkedIn kind of troll you, so to speak. So these don't hold a ton of weight. Yeah, the, the endorsements is kind of the joke section. I think this reminds me of when uh, Facebook made had used to have the poke back in the day. Mm -hmm. It's just still there. No one really knows why. No one takes it seriously. <laughs> um, skills and interest are fine. But again, like it's not something like no recruiter is going to not contact you based on this. So um, not, it's, you know, not something worth worrying about. I'm seeing a comment here, Mary, I will agree with you. So back to the last section on featured, if you're in the creative, if you're a designer or someone like that, um, that's the type of person who should definitely have stuff in your featured section. Um, but I guess I'm speaking more to, to other audiences that might not be in the different fields. Um, there might not be anything that's more visually appealing that would be as relevant there. So, but anyway, not saying not to do it, but it's yeah. not worth losing sleep over. Exactly. And then recommendations is the last um, section that we want to talk about. This is kind of like your virtual references. So when we think about this section, like the likelihood of somebody leaving a recommendation on your profile that isn't great is probably not going to happen. So these don't necessarily hold like a ton of weight. And most of the time when you're going through an interview process, if you know, you're a candidate of choice, your potential employer is going to do a background and reference check on you anyway. So they're not necessarily going to spend a ton of time looking through the recommendations that you have on LinkedIn. But you know, it's somewhat important for branding. It's nice to have, but again, don't lose a ton of sleep over this if you don't have any recommendations on your page. Yeah, this is the one that I, I think it gets overrated quite a bit. And it might sound kind of ridiculous to say, but um, again, this is on the front end of a process. Not This is not a reference check, but this is just getting found on LinkedIn. No recruiter is going to not contact you because you didn't have recommendations on your profile. Um, and then likewise, they're also, if you're at the final stages, they're not going to not do, they're not going to do their own reference checks because they saw something on your LinkedIn profile. So it's a nice to have, if you know someone really impressive and well-known who gives you a great recommendation, great. But again, you're not, not getting calls or getting contacted because your recommendations here weren't good enough. So, um, just to say, again, I don't mean to completely poo poo all these sections. I'm not saying don't do them, but, um, if you're going to spend more and more time, on your LinkedIn profile, the other sections we talked about, the first three sections are the ones that you really need to, by spending more and more time on them, you can make a huge impact, whereas these are um, very incremental, I would say. So now I want to show a really quick example of where all of these features that we talked about live on LinkedIn. And we are going to use um, one of our colleagues LinkedIn profiles. He's used to us sharing it. We have his OK. So um, we want to walk through Don's profile just really quickly so that I can highlight the areas that we talked about um, so that you know exactly where those are on your profile. So for Don, um, we can see right here is where his header lives. Um, and this is, again, that piece that's going to essentially follow him around LinkedIn. Whenever he comments on something, this will also come up. It's going to help with both the SEO and branding piece. Don mentions that he's a lead recruiter at Hirewall. He can't code, but he probably knows who can. So from that, we can make the assumption he's probably focusing on technology recruiting. Um, when we scroll down a bit further, we can see Don's about section. This is that digital cover letter where we want you to tell the story. What, what does your audience need to know about you? How did you find your way into a certain career? Why are you looking to pivot careers? Don does a really good job at kind of telling the story, how he found his way into recruiting, which is great because I think a lot of us don't really choose this profession. We end up in it and then um, enjoy it that way. But Don kind of breaks down 
how he found his way into recruiting. He even gets really specific about the types of roles he's focusing on or those skill sets within recruiting. So from that piece, as a recruiter, I know the skill set that Don brings to the table. So he does a really good job at optimizing this section of his profile. And then he also gives us a little bit of a blurb on higher wall too. So we have an idea of the company that he works for as well. This is that featured section, a nice to have component. Don does a good job at providing some information on here. He's, um, he's pinned an article that he and I wrote together. He has a few videos on here, so we can kind of put a face to a name, to a voice and all of the above, um, which is great that he's optimized that. But again, not gonna be something that makes or break it um, in terms of a recruiter reaching out. Um, and then his experience of um, experience. So this is again, where you're gonna put the story behind the work that you're doing, really diving into the responsibilities, the skill sets that you have, those key accomplishments. Don also does a good job really breaking that down in, um, in his profile. Again, kind of talking about the specific types of positions that he's working on within recruiting, um, talking about the relationship management and overseeing some of the largest accounts that he works on and that sort of thing. And he does that for each of his roles down here as well. And then if we scroll a bit further, those skills and endorsements, he's endorsed for social networking and sales. And you know maybe he is great at those, but again, don't hold a ton of weight. And then finally, those recommendations, Joe and Matt both say that Don is a great person to work with, which James and I agree, but we're not necessarily going to reach out to him or not because somebody said he's great to work with. All right, so let's just do a quick recap here on the things that we just discussed. So when you're thinking about your LinkedIn profile and what you need to optimize, we really want you to fill out as much as you can, but you wanna spend the most time on those critical pieces and you can kind of worry less about the other sections. Again, we're not saying don't fill them out, but you don't have to stress about them either. So those critical pieces, the header, that memorable first impression that follows you around LinkedIn forever, um, you can edit that of course, but your summary, which is gonna add the personality and context, and that's a searchable feature by recruiters. Experience, those are describing your exact experiences, the skill sets and accomplishments that you have. Again, searchable right by recruiters. Then those nice to have sections, they add a little bit more on the branding piece featured in endorsement, skills, and interests, and recommendations. So we got a bunch of questions here, too, so I'll try to go through some of them. Um, the last thing I'll say, too, is um, I, if I were going to kind of maybe state this in a different way, that top section, what's, what's critical, that's where I would spend 95% of my time. Mm -hmm. The bottom section is where I'd spend 5%, just from like a time management standpoint. All right, so some questions. Uh, Paula, does it uh, does it help, however, to have more than a few impressive recs from C-suite and execs, for example? Um, yeah, sure. If you're going to get any recommendations at all, you want to get them. I would say if you're going to spend any time on it and you have people that are C-level executives of the company um, that can say that'll go a lot further. Um, the, 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 the joke about references in general um, and as a recruiter, which I can say like, literally everybody's got two or three people that'll say something nice about them. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why, honestly, most people, like recruiters don't put as much stock into those as you might think, um, just because it's assumed that everyone's going to have some people who are good. But yes, if you've got people who are um, recognizable as, as, and, and fairly well-known um, executive people, those are the people I definitely um, uh, put on there. Does it matter if the references are older? I have some from years ago, but haven't asked for any recently. This is from Lisa. Um, honestly, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know it, again like if you want to get some new ones great but like that the top section your header and summer experience you are absolutely getting or not getting contacted by people based upon what's in there the recommendations that has no bearing if people were if a recruiter is going to contact you or not so that's again how i'd kind of answer that question so um what uh, from Aaron, what advice do you have for people who have a dual purpose for their LinkedIn account, meaning they have a career and a side hustle or a business on their own that they're trying to grow? Um, I don't see any problem with um, having um, dual things, some people's profiles. I've known a lot of people over the years who um, they might have a side business or something separate. I don't think it holds you back. Um, uh, there might be people out there that say it makes you look unfocused, but I've never thought that that really held any water. Um, I think that if anything, it's an interesting talking point. Um, 
if you've got some unrelated business or something on the side that you're doing, you know, when you're finally actually talking to a recruiter or a hiring manager live, um, it won't really impact how you show up in, in searches either in terms of that initial way of getting found. So I say, um, you know, you can set things up to, to kind of cover both. Um, maybe have it more focused on if you're, if you're, if the primary purpose for your profile is to search for a job, then you probably want to spend more time and make that section more robust. But I don't see any problem with, um, including the other. Uh, so I want to go to a meeting. No worries. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my question is regarding a good header profile. If my work is now in a different industry um, and position than my previous experience before the gap um, was my main educational work experience from 17 years post college. How do I go about reflecting the two different jobs experience in this profile and keep myself open to both opportunities? Um, so if I'm reading this correctly, um, you want to be considered for, for both. Um, uh, I would say for header, you're gonna have to go with what, you're probably gonna have to pick or choose one thing here just because you have a very limited amount of characters. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's 120 characters, Ryan, does that sound right? Yeah, I think Not so. Many. I think it's less than what you have on Twitter, essentially. Yeah, it's it's very, you can't say a whole lot here, so you have to be extremely mm -hmm. punchy. So um, I think you I, I think you have to pick which, which area you wanna go to in terms of your header, um, just because you're not gonna be able to do yourself, um, you'll do a disservice to yourself if you try to, talk about two different things that section just not enough characters to, to give the message across um siri do linkedin profiles have the same seven seconds rule on how long a recruiter will look at your page for instance how long should the summary section be that it'll grab attention without making it too long um so the summary section is actually kind of nested. Um, mm -hmm. You're only gonna see the first three lines or so unless they click into it further. Um, and maybe that's something we should kind of talk about further is you wanna make sure that if, if for the summary section, which is the middle section, that's not the experience section, that's kind of like your cover letter section. People typically only click that if they're already, if they're already in and really wanna read more about you. Mm -hmm. um, it does get picked up by um, the search parts, which is why it's important to kind of fill that out because you want to make sure you have as much in there and also the branding aspect. Um, I would say the seven seconds rule still applies and it's going to be people are going to look at your header and they're going to scroll down to your experience with the top thing that's there. So that's where you probably need to do the most work in terms of making sure you grab people's attention. Um, so I wouldn't worry about um, uh, you don't want to shorten the summary section because they, the way it has it nested, um, they have to click to expand it anyway. So um, if that's a worry, don't, don't worry about that. Um, should we list all the positions we held? Sure. Um, mm -hmm. I don't see why not. Um, if uh, it's, it's up to you though, some people this, um, some people um, don't want to show how long their career is. Um, if, if that's a concern for you, there's nothing wrong with taking things off. Um, but I don't see an issue either way. Um, I would make sure that whatever, um, if you made a career change, um, you know, I personally, what I would do in mine is have at least all the positions in there. If, if the old career you had previously is not something you want to come back to, um, cause someone had a question about this earlier saying they may be open to it, then you probably don't need to be as, um, as detailed there. But personally, I would put everything in there, but I'm totally okay with it. If people don't, I don't think that holds anyone back either. Again, um, you're getting found based upon what you put in there and not what you don't put in there. So. Um, examples of items in a summary experience area that will grab recruiters attention. Um, I would say personally for experience, because experience is your more traditional, more like a resume section. Um, that's really going to come down to recruiters care about making, I mean, from a search standpoint, and because I don't want to, I don't want to undercut this, like you need to make sure the keywords are in there. And that's not that saying that everything's keyword focused, but that's just the truth of it. If you don't have the keywords in there that you need, you're not going to show up in searches. So that's especially, for, I'd say for both sections, but especially experience, you want to make sure that's in there. Um, and then I'm always big on, and this is more classic resume um, advice. You want to make sure there's examples of projects. You want to make sure there's examples of like metrics. Um, are you going to say it, James? 
Yeah, yeah, you want, I almost forgot, so thank you. You want to make sure you're a data-driven storyteller. So that is, that's my catchphrase. Um, you want to tell stories of projects and things that you've worked on, and you want to tie those down to quantifiable metrics if possible. That's stuff that's really going to make anything pop in your experience section. Um, summary section, honestly, that's, that's a little more up to you. You can get as personal as you want there. You can tell your story and how you got here. You can talk about what you're passionate about. You know, it's, it's your cover letter. So, um, I would say anything that's a little more stories focused that can kind of build a narrative in the mind of the reader is what you want to focus in the summary section. Um, Uh, do you need to show if you have gaps on your employment due to some reason? How do you best write it in LinkedIn? Um, I've, I've heard different schools of thought on this. Um, uh, personally, if your experience matches, and, and again, this is, um, this is not the, uh, you're not at the interview phase yet. Um, this is just trying to get found. And um, I, if someone has good experience from what I can tell, but there's, you know, maybe a gap in, in their, their profile, I'm, I'm the type of person I actually think most recruiters, like, they want to find, they, they'd rather contact you and talk with you about it than, you know, we're trying, always trying to find good people. Um, so if, if the experience that you do have listed matches, you're, you should, most recruiters will still contact you. Uh, I, I have to hedge that because I'm sure there's some, you know, that aren't that good that, that might, may not, but um, it kind of depends. It's, I guess it's also situational too. Like every situation is different. Um, if it's something you feel can be explained, go ahead. If it's something you feel more comfortable saying in person, if you feel like you need to, then do that. It's, it's largely up to you. Um, One thing that I want to mention about that really quickly is for some folks, if they have a gap on their um, in their employment history, sometimes they'll put that in as like a job. For example, maybe you took some time off to raise your family or care for a sick loved one, or maybe you just took time off to travel and took a personal sabbatical. Some people will have that as essentially a role in their experience to explain the gap, but you don't have to do that. Like James said, it depends on your comfort level and kind of what you want to share and not. Um, I love this next one, Everett. Is it impressive when people with their side hustles listed states CEO, president, owner, even though it's just a small one person <laughs> business? No, it's not. <laughs> it's not in, in fact, if someone if someone put on their pres on their profile like one person business side hustle, I would laugh and think mm -hmm. that person's funny. Like that, I would that would be a better way of going about it. So well, there's a lot of questions here. We got to get back to the main presentation too. Yeah. Um, we can maybe spend some time at the end and circle back to those. Um, yeah, to, okay, yeah. We're gonna through. come back to these guys. We wanna make sure we don't forget the rest of the presentation. Yeah, because we still have more to share. All right, so we wanna do a walkthrough now and give you guys that behind the hood or under the hood type of view of LinkedIn Recruiter. So a lot of this is gonna look unfamiliar, but don't worry, you don't really have to understand how LinkedIn Recruiter operates. What we wanna do is just showcase some of the things that we talked about today and how people come up in searches and kind of what those profiles look like on our end as a recruiter. All right, so let's go to LinkedIn Recruiter. So for the purpose of today's search, just to kind of um, level set what we're gonna be looking at today, um, we're gonna do a specific search tailored here to folks at HireWall so that we're not sharing people's profiles without their consent. Um, this page in itself probably looks really unfamiliar to a lot of people. On the left-hand side here, you can see that um, we have kind of our, our um, various filters and things like that. I've already created a bit of like a, a search that we're going to do today. Hopefully LinkedIn hasn't timed out and I don't have to sign back in. We'll keep our fingers crossed on that. But you can see some of the areas over here um, that we talked about originally at the start of the, this webinar, talking about some of those custom um, filters. So job titles and locations. I've already filled in the company. We want to target HireWall today. And if we scroll down a bit more to postal and zip code, we can see that we're going to be targeting Chicago. And we can even... Um, we can even um, customize the search uh, radius that we want to focus on. So we're going to be looking at folks that work here in Chicago um, 
at higher wall within a 25 mile radius. Um, and we also want to do a pretty specific search today. So we're going to be looking for IT recruiters here at higher wall. Um, I've already created my search string um, within LinkedIn recruiter. We use Boolean searches. They can be really finicky. If you don't have them exactly right, then they won't work out, which is why I've already created these. So we're going to start by searching job titles. Um, you can see at this top um, corner here, there's 48 people that are currently coming up in our search. So if we plug in the job titles um, that we're looking for, we can see that search um, comes down to 20. So the folks that are coming up in this search now are recruiters that work here at Higher Wall that have the job title somewhere in their current or past work history that live within a 25 mile radius of the zip code that we put in. I want to share a specific um, profile with you and I have it pulled up because sometimes LinkedIn based on their filters show people in different spots but you can see that there's a number of people that are coming up and uh, the reason why they're coming up is highlighted here with uh, the job titles that we put into our search. So we want to show um, a profile. Her name is Leah. Leah works here at Higher Well with us. Um, and I want to show you the, the specific areas we talked about being critical and where those live on here. So with Leah, we can see she's a recruiter here at Higher Well. This is her header section, but it's not super memorable. We also have no idea what area of recruiting based on that alone Leah is focusing on. Um, so if we scroll down, maybe we'll get some more information. We can see her summary section. I personally think that Leah does a great job at giving you a good taste of her background um, professionally and not. Um, it, she has a pretty unique job history. So I like that she has talked about that and kind of the skill sets that she's gained from various positions she's had. And then she also does give Give us a list here of um, the areas that she recruits in. So those specific roles or skill sets, which is great. We can kind of, you know, make the assumption from there that she's probably in technology recruiting. But that important section that we really want to pay attention to experience, unfortunately, Leah doesn't do an awesome job at optimizing this portion of her profile. So she has the jobs listed, but from my view in LinkedIn Recruiter, her role at Higher Wall, I have no idea what type of recruiting she's doing. I don't know if she's focusing in technology or accounting and finance. And if I don't know who Higher Wall is, I might not have any idea the, the skill sets that Higher Wall focuses on. Same with um, her last position um, as a tech recruiter. She just really doesn't give us enough information in this section um, for us to know whether or not she's a fit potentially for a role. I feel like we need to say uh, as a disclaimer because I don't think we mentioned this time. Yes, we did tell some of our coworkers <laughs> to not completely fill out some sections of their profile yes. just for purposes of this presentation. Exactly. So. <laughs> and they know that we're using them as examples too. So their feelings <laughs> will not be hurt by us sharing this information. All right, so we looked at job titles and we saw how that impacts the search that we originally started with. We saw that we have 20 people. One of the other areas that we've talked about throughout this presentation um, is with regards to keywords. So we want to search via keywords right now. So I'm going to go ahead and clear out the job title search. We'll go back to that original list of 48 people. And as you can see on my little sticky note here, I have another search string and these are the keywords that I want to search with. So it's a little bit more robust than the job title search. And these are going to pull from any portion of a LinkedIn profile, including the header, the summary section, and experience. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste this and plug it in. And we'll look at how that changes the search string that we are working with. All right, so originally when we did the job title search, we had 20 results. Now we have 28. So you can see that the keyword search is really important. What I wanna point out about job titles is this is different everywhere, right? Like every company calls the same job something different. So it can be really hard to get the right title in for somebody's um, role and to find them as a person. So sometimes recruiter, recruiters will lean even more heavily on keyword searches because we'll get more folks in that way um, as opposed to, you know, some companies have like strange job titles that don't really, you know, show what somebody's work um, looks like. So that's the reason why recruiters will use um, keyword searches. All of these folks are coming up again because they work at Higher Wall, they live within that 25 mile radius of the zip code that we put in. And at least one of the keywords that we put in that search string are somewhere on those searchable sections of their profile.
So we're going to share another example here of Allie. Um, Allie's header is right here. She is a lead recruiter of the technology practice here at HireWall. So not super memorable header, but we at least know that she's recruiting within technology, which is great. Um, if we scroll down, her summary section is okay. I think Allie could do a better job at kind of giving us a more personal um, approach, maybe telling us about how she's found her way into recruiting. She doesn't specify the area that she's recruiting for in here or talk about the specific um, skill set. So if we're looking for somebody really specific, maybe Allie wouldn't be someone we reach out to because there's just not enough information quite yet. And then if we scroll down to her experience section, Again, she doesn't really optimize these um, components of her profile. So it might not be somebody that we reach out to because if we're looking for a really specific skill set within technology recruiting and she doesn't delineate that in some other areas, she might not be someone that we touch base with. And then the final example I wanna share again, um, Don is somebody that would have come up in both the keyword and the job title search. Um, we wanna talk about Don's profile. We've seen how it looks on the regular version of LinkedIn Recruiter, but how does it look on, um, of LinkedIn, I'm sorry, but how does it look on the recruiter version? So this is where Don's profile um, starts. We can see his header section right here, lead recruiter at Hirewall, he can't code, but probably knows who can. Based on that alone, just because I like the header and I think it's catchy, he might be somebody that I connect with whether or not he's gonna be a perfect fit for the role I'm working on because I don't quite have enough information yet. But as a recruiter, I like that he's taken the time to optimize that section. Scrolling down to a summary, we've seen this before, but again, John does a good job at telling his personal story, how he found his way into recruiting, the specific areas of technology recruiting that he focuses on. He even gives us a bit of um, a dive into higher wall too. So great optimization on his summary section. And then finally, the experience. Again, he's fully optimized this. We know exactly what it is that he's doing, the responsibilities that he has. He's putting in those keywords with um, the skill sets that he's focusing on, which is great. Um, so Don would definitely be somebody that we, re we reach out to based on the optimization that he has. All right. So that is LinkedIn Recruiter, a look behind the hood. I think now is probably a good time for us to go back to some of those questions and answer those. Yeah, so we got about 10 minutes left. Um, so we'll go back to where we left off with questions. So thanks everyone who's uh, um, being patient with that. Um, if you guys wanna connect with us on LinkedIn, um, we're both easy to find. So feel free just to, to look us up there and shoot us an invite. I'll accept them all. Um, and our email address is here if you need any help. Um, so let's get back to it. Um, David, what if a recruiter is looking at you for what is not your primary thing? Uh, example, you're an artist with a relevant non-artistic job. If your profile shows off, um, sh profile shows you think of yourself as an artist, would recruiters for the non-artistic side be turned off? Um, I guess the, the best way, I, I think this might be relating back to what I was saying before about people who have, might have two gigs or a side mm -hmm. gig. Um, there's, it really depends on how well you're able to articulate what it is you're, you're looking for and what your primary job is. Like I'm all for people putting their side gigs in their profiles, but the way you set it up, it should still be apparent which one is your main job versus which one is kind of your, your side gig you're putting in there for context. So I think it's all in the phrasing of, and, and the other parts too, in terms of like the experience section and the, uh, the headline, how are you really kind of like, um, defining yourself in terms of what's going to be relevant to what a recruiter is going to look at. So. Uh, Paula was once told not to post your resume or put all the details in your profile, rather just enough to capture attention and get them to reach out. Uh, do you agree? And is this maybe why your thoughts on experience are to not copy and paste from resume, rather give some context, be more story-like? Um, I think resumes need to be a little more story-like in general, um, mm -hmm. maybe not to the same extent. I think um, to your point about being told not to post your whole resume, I think some people's resumes are just too long. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's the thing is that if you were, if you're, if, if you, not you in particular, but if you're the type of person who has like a four page resume, I guarantee each of these job sections will be way too long. Like it's mm -hmm. on the page visually on the web page, it's going to look odd that you put that much detail on there. So um, I think uh, if you have a concise one page resume or one and a half page resumes, uh, I, I think it'd probably be fine. I'm just kind of guesstimating here. Um, but I think it really comes down to um, you want to, 
you want to make sure you have the, the, the high points in terms of what you do. You want to make sure you're hitting the keywords, but you don't need to just go, um, just go too long with it where it just looks odd on the page. One thing I want to um, add to that too is as much as LinkedIn is a professional site, it's also a social site too. So like that's why showcasing your personality is important on there because it is another way to network with people and to network with people or know who you want to network with. You have to be able to like understand if there's somebody that you want to connect with in general, right? So like making those sections more story-like is important for that reason too. Uh, Mary, thanks for mentioning length of career, and please keep in mind other points where age can be a factor. Um, conflict between taking care of what experience. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I I think that um, um, ageism is a real thing, and it's something that um, everyone should be kind of cognizant of. And um, I don't think anyone will hold it against you, or anybody who's worth anything will hold it against you if you choose not to put certain things on your profile. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly understand, and if that's the route you want to go with it, so. Um, uh, I work for a single agency for five years across three different client companies. Should I condense those positions for clarity and brevity? Um, I think you can. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I, I probably would. And, and maybe there, I think there's probably a way within um, you could you, you could do concurrent positions if you wanted to, or you could even put in the experience summary. Um, actually, you have one company listed and then underneath there, as you kind of define what you did, you know, you can make mention there, you were kind of work with three different subsidiary brands if you wanted to, if you felt that was necessary. Um, the key thing is you're not being, you're not being, um, you're telling the truth if you're working, you know what I mean? You're not like being withholding or anything else like that. And again, this isn't your resume. So if you need to have that conversation and someone asks you later, you're at this company, you can do that in the interview process, it's fine. You can take a look at my LinkedIn profile as well, because I have categorized my one of my roles like that. I held a number of positions at one company, and instead of kind of listing all of those out with job titles, I kept it all under one and then um, organized it under there so you could see the different roles that I used. Um, uh, if a candidate is willing to relocate, should they put their location as US or should they still stay specific on location? Good question. Um, I would say the challenge, I guess the only, uh, if I'm the job seeker, I would say, yeah, go ahead and do it. Um, mm -hmm. the, the question you're going to get asked is, and it, we're getting in a much deeper topic, is like work authorization. Um, so it also kind of depends, like, are you, do you need sponsorship? Um, make sure you're upfront with the recruiter about that because mm -hmm. if they're able to provide sponsorship, you know, great. There's going to be some recruiters that just, it's not, their company's not able to do it. Um, so you don't want to waste your time or theirs by not being kind of clear about that. But um, if there's, I would say if you're trying to show up in a U.S. based search because you're trying to move to the U.S., I, I, I think you kind of have to, otherwise you're just not going to show up. I don't know what you think, Ryan. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I think like James mentioned, that does kind of go into a much deeper topic. For example, there's a lot of organizations that aren't open to helping someone relocate because they don't have the budget for it or just the time constraints are too um, tight to consider that. So I think as a job seeker, sure, put it. Um, it's just a little complex. In what order do search results appear? <laughs> Nobody really knows. <laughs> I wish we knew. That the, the, al right. <laughs> the algorithm is always changing. And it seems every time we, we've done this presentation three times and the results come up different every single time we do them. Which so. is why I didn't go through the search results to find the profiles I wanted to share. Because like James said, they've showed up differently each time we've done it. So it's just easier to pull them out of the search. If one is working remote, do we need to a specific location? I guess this is... Um, uh, it's a good question. Um, so it, it, think of it this way. It kind of depends on what they're recruiting for, because there's way more companies now who are open to and looking for remote people than there were just a few years ago. Um, I would, okay, so there's some companies that are 100% remote companies. They don't care if people are located as long as they're maybe in the US or whatever their, their, their home country is. And then there's other companies that, you know, they, um, they would hire people remote right now, but they'd still prefer their region because who knows where we're gonna be a year from now. So um, if you don't have location down, there 
some companies you'll still show up in the searches and they're going to contact you, but there will be some that, you know, they haven't kind of nailed down their plans yet. And if given the choice, they'd probably, they'd first go after people who are local before they start going remote. So that's just the reality of it. So you'd have to kind of make your own decision on what you want to do there. Um, if there's a location you think you'd want to work in, I would put that down. Um, but you just have to be kind of aware that there's going to be some companies are going to fall into one camp, some companies are going to fall in the other, and there's nothing you can do to change how they're going to do searches. You just kind of have to figure out where what's going to I guess, set you up best. There's also sections on your LinkedIn page where if you're open to opportunities, you can kind of um, you can put in certain areas like I'm open to relocating to X, Y, and Z, or I'm only looking for remote work, or I'm only open to full-time opportunities. Um, and those I think are just in your preferences or settings section. Um, I don't know exactly where they live, but you're able to um, add that information in on the back end where it's basically just going to come up on the recruiter's version. Uh, does title search get so specific where if you're looking for a director of marketing and my title is director of marketing communications, I assume it still appear. Yeah, you should. Um, I, I don't think the, the people are the way they have the searches set up. It's usually not exact match or um, that's where the um, you might it might change how it works in relevance, but you should still show up in the search. You shouldn't get excluded based upon that. Mm -hmm. Uh, what resource do you recommend best for a job seeker interested to move back to biotech clinical trials, research and administration after 20 year gap? I used to conduct the research and then program management of the group doing the research trials. Um, I am not. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not. A, well, I'm not a biopharma expert, so I won't sell myself as that. Honestly, you're going to have to network your way back in. Mm -hmm. um, Anytime someone tries to make a, a pivot, even if it's a pivot back to once, anytime you're trying to find something, it's really not what you're doing right now. Um, applying to jobs and hoping people find you on LinkedIn is honestly not the best way of going about it. Um, we talk a lot about this in their, their content that we have. It's free, by the way, on careerwell.io plug. Um, but you want more of a networking focus approach where you're setting up informational interviews and you want to proactively just network people at those types of companies. The person you want to ask this question to is the person who has that job right now, not me. Um, they can tell you what they would look at for someone who is out of the industry and what they look to hire for. So what I would do, make a list of companies you want to go work for, step one. Step two, find people who work at those companies that are in a position to hire. And step three, shoot a connect request or an email and say, hey, um, I'm looking to get back into industry. Um, I'm looking for some advice. Don't say I'm looking to, don't say like, hey, are you hiring? It, ask them a question. Are you willing to talk with me? Would love to pick your brain how I can get back into the industry. Um, you will get a way higher response rate on that question because people love helping other people more so than they love answering job requests. It's a bizarre <laughs> thing, but it's real. Um, and once you start having those conversations, there, you'll get people in the industry who will be able to give you specific actionable steps of what they would do if they were you, which is the most valuable way of going about it. And then also, if you kill it in that conversation, knock out of the park, you'll probably get an interview or a follow up or an introduction to somebody else who can really help you out. Um, should you always do exact job search, uh, exact job title, or can you give a more general one? Um, I, I think the job titles are, you can have, you have a little bit of liberty with job titles as long as it's descriptive Agreed. and accurate. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't if you're not be... saying you sit in the C-suite when you don't, I think it's fine. Um, especially if you're working at an organization that maybe has some of those like more unique job titles, if it makes sense to put something that I think is more generalist or, um, you know, that, that you would see in that industry, then I think that's fine. Um, uh, for experience, should we say May 2006 to December 2008 or 2006 to 2008? Um, I always preferred, um, and this is just classic resume evaluation, I always preferred seeing months and years. Agreed. Um, just because when you put years in without months, um, people assume you're trying to hide something, mm -hmm. trying to hide a gap. And I'm not really critical of people who had gaps. But um, I, there are going to be a lot of people out there who will kind of think twice on it. That being said, you may still get contacted about it. Like you might not be missing on opportunities, but they're probably going to that'll be something they'll probably follow up on and ask. So um, I would just put in month and year if you can. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts about backgrounds and having professionally taken profile pictures? If you have an uh, example of a star profile you can share. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to pull up a profile right now. Well, you can pull up my profile, Ryan. I think it's a star I'll profile. I'll do that. Um, <laughs> I'll 
Let's look at James. Um, honestly, I think you want to have a fun profile picture. Um, I think it, it goes back to branding and being memorable. Like the boring old headshot is just, it's, it's just boring. Um, I there, also there's mine. have this on a coffee mug. In case anyone wants one, you can send James a message and he will send one to your house. <laughs> oh, let's not have a promise here. <laughs> but yeah, I've had more people just comment on my stupid profile picture than I can count. Um, and that's just Nia in our office was taking pictures one day and I just you know, was making a funny face and I just thought it looked like a good picture. Um, I don't think, prof we, oh, we'll put it this way too. We hired a photographer twice to do professional headshots of the, the company. The first one was a nightmare. Yeah, they were both sets were terrible but then we had our digital specialist just go around with her iphone and just take fun pictures and it was pretty much unanimous that everyone liked their picture taken by our specialist who's not a photographer by the way better so i think candid shots are better than professional shots but that's just my opinion i do want to touch base on this really quickly though because i think there's a fine line between candid and overly filtered so if you're using like a snapchat filter or something like that this is still a professional site so like we don't want you to have like an overly filtered picture or when you're thinking about industry too for example if you're in like professional financial services or something like that probably makes sense for you to kind of mimic that and have a bit more of a professional um photo up there but we want it to still be personable we want it to still showcase your personality so just think about what's going to make sense for where you're at um oh, ryan you click on yours did Nia take yours too your picture um, or is that one of the photographer ones i think Whatever. it was i think it was one of the photographer ones but here's mine Okay, I thought Nia took that one. Anyways, um, I don't think you need to hire a photographer. I think if you have someone who's just kind of savvy with an iPhone or their Android or their, their, their phone, you'll be fine. Um, yes, it's being recorded. Just thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm trying to see if there's any others. Have to go. Uh, I need a good cover letter, LinkedIn profile to reflect the updated overall job and volunteer experiences, gap years, most recent work history in different positions. Do you just work with companies seeking candidates or do you work with candidates to and optimize their resume LinkedIn? Um, yeah, shoot us. Uh, that's what CareerWall does, um, Azita. So if you want to um, shoot me an email, james at hirewall.com. Um, I can get you connected with somebody on that team to focus on that. Any suggestions on banner photo? Um, do something that you like. Like for example, I have the Chicago theater. I like having that because as a recruiter, a lot of people just assume I'm like searching nationally all the time. So I try to like add a little bit of like Chicago in there to um, to categorize myself in there. Um, so I think you can do whatever you like. James, is yours a photo that you took? Yeah, it's a photo I took in um, Puerto Rico. We'll check out James just, really quickly. I just like street art. So I took a picture of- Love some good street art. Yeah, it used to render differently. You used to be able to see more of that wall. They must have you can edit it, change don't worry. Site. Yeah, all right. Um, but yeah, there was actually the picture before they recently cropped it, um, had a lot more street art on it. So I, thought it was, I just thought it was cool. Um, picture on a resume, I wouldn't. Um, I think that there's, there's a lot of discussion about this topic um, just from a diversity inclusion standpoint. And um, people being discriminated against based upon their, what their appearance is, regardless of what their um, what their background is, I, I wouldn't put it on. Um, headshot of myself in a costume as Obi-Wan Kenobi, that's awesome. <laughs> Why not? Um, Go for it. Do we need to post our resume on LinkedIn? No. Um, most of the time recruiters will ask you for it anyway, because we don't always assume that that's an updated version. Some people have their resume up there. They don't even know it's up there. So we'll probably ask you to send us one anyway. Uh, we're getting down to the, the bottom here with COVID and people being out of work. Do recruiters actually look at course taken work? Digital marketing certificate um, does hold any value. Um, I actually think, okay, um, here, here's my hot take. I think certifications as, um, as the paper in your hand are pretty much worthless. No one really cares. But if you can demonstrate the knowledge you learn from it, that's what's important. So um, I think there's, you can, uh, so that being said, 
if you had some downtime this year and you learned some things and you can demonstrate what you learned, great. That will help you out. That's something you can take the interview. That's what you can talk about to articulate your knowledge. But nobody cares about a certification because as we as as everyone knows, like a lot of certifications, you know, they aren't that hard to get um, and they don't necessarily translate the ability to do something. So um, I think is make the focus more on if you've got a, maybe a portfolio or an example or talk about something you've done and be able to get into detail. That's what will help you out when you get to the interview stage. Thoughts on videos, intros, resumes. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, I love anything with video. I think it's, it comes down to an interesting way of delivering it. Um, I don't know, if, if Ryan, if you have any specific, anybody specific. I, I think it's yeah, an area where- I've gotten, just... I've gotten some weird ones. So I feel like I feel pretty indifferently about the video intros. Um, I think if it makes, again, think about like your industry, the type of role or who you're trying to connect with, like tailor it to your audience, obviously. And if you keep that in mind, then I think that's all you have to do. Um, Flint, yeah, PMP is different. That's like a, um, that's a legit certification that's for like industry specific. I think we were talking about like a digital marketing, digital marketing certificate from you to me. It's a little bit different, but like, um, we're just getting like your Google AdWords, you know, it's great you have that, but everyone should have that is kind mm -hmm. of the thing anyone's in that field. Um, uh, would I miss anything here? Uh, your advice about staying remote work as, as your preference. Um, I guess it comes down to if you're if you're legitimately only open to remote work, then say that. If um, if but if you if you say you're only looking for remote, but you really you would do something on site, um, you could inadvertently um, uh, lose out on a few things. So I wouldn't say that per se, unless it was something where it's like a hard stop for you. You can always come back later in the interview process and decide not move forward. So I would put that filter, that mental filter, if you want to move forward with something at that point. Good point, especially with the COVID environment we're experiencing right now, like almost everybody's working remotely if they can, but we probably won't be working remotely forever, a good portion of us anyway. So if, like James said, you're, you have to clarify whether or not it's something that, you know, you need to do for the rest of your career, or if it's just a preference two more and I got to bounce. I actually got a call in five minutes. Um, <laughs> we're, we're way over, but that's cool. Um, top tech jobs um, in your viewpoint, DevOps. Uh, so right now, DevOps, cloud computing, um, and that whole realm has blown up. So anything in that kind of the cloud space is huge right now. And there's not enough people to go around. And then obviously development is perennially just always in high demand. So anything like the DevOps or cloud, um, you know, kind of the new age infrastructure type roles or dev, uh, always hot. Um, Ryan, um, what are your thoughts on HR certifications like um, SHRM, HRCI, AIRS? I don't know what those are. I know that's your field. Yeah, so with SHRM, I think a lot of folks have that and it's fine too. I have, in full transparency, I've never worked on a position in the three years I've been at higher law where that's been a make or, bake, um, make or break requirement. So I think it's important, especially for networking purposes, like it's great for that. And I think you get a lot out of it in, in that sense and to keep up with policies and um, legal compliance and things like that. But again, it's never been a, a requirement of a role I've worked on. Um, how do we turn off notifications so, so we don't keep, actually, I'm not sure. How do we turn off notifications while we make changes so we don't keep popping up? Oh, there is a way that you can do that. If you just do a quick Google search, it'll show you the step-by-step, -step, but I don't know what the steps are off the top of my head. Yeah. Google for the, for the win. All right. Mm -hmm. That's all I got time for. Um, everyone, thanks for coming. Um, yes. Thank you so much. And you guys, fantastic questions. And James and Ryan, thank you so much for staying extra um, to answer all of those. Thanks for um, having us. Yeah, no, this was this was awesome. I don't want to I don't want to keep anyone everyone too much longer. Um, but just as a reminder, we'll be sending a recap out um, with the recording, some highlights, how you can stay connected with Hirewell and with James and Ryan, of course, information about Amla Vita as well. Um, great partnership here. So really excited about everything today. You guys are awesome. Um, please feel free to respond back to that email when you get it with any questions. Um, but thank you all so much. And thank you again, James and Ryan, you guys rock. Thank you. Have Thanks a good one, everybody. Appreciate Bye. it. Bye guys. Bye.